So welcome to this, the second part on atomic spectroscopy, where we will be encountering spectrometer components, um, especially those for ICPMS, those for AAS, and some of the light sources that we will be using in atomic spectroscopy. Uh, these are some of the most fundamental uh, analytical chemistry techniques, and so they are really important in quantitative, instrumental, and analytical chemistry. So there are five principal components in an AAS spectrometer. There is going to be um, some sort of um, light source. So uh, usually that's going to be um, a modulated light source like this, uh, which is attached to uh, a lamp. So this modulated power source will provide enough energy to the lamp that we will get light out of it, but nothing else will really happen. Um, so then, so it will you know last a long time. Then this will pass through uh, the flame, because we will direct the beam of light from the lamp, and it will pass through the flame with a known path length, usually around about 10 centimeters. Um, this will then pass through some sort of monochromator, such as this Ebert monochromator. We can have a look at it in a moment. And then this includes like uh, collimating mirrors and gratings. Uh, we've already encountered uh, monochromators and how those work in earlier lectures, but we will do a, a brief sort of uh, recap here. Um, then we have uh, some sort of um, modulating device, like a shutter, which can shut the light on and off. We have a, a way to chop uh, a chopper, which can chop the light um, to make it uh, come in packets. Then we have an amplifier, which can amplify the signal. And then we have some readout device, could be a computer, could be simply a screen. So these five principal components are the light source, typically a hollow cathode lamp in uh, atomic absorption spectroscopy. Uh, we have the atom cell, which is the, you know, the atomizer. It would be a cuvette in our UV vis spectroscopy from before. We have the monochromator as a way of separating the light into the wavelengths that we actually want. Then we have a detector, which will detect the light um, and amplify it. And then we will have a readout. So, our light source, then uh, typically a hollow cathode lamp. We, we've encountered those before, but we didn't really go into them in too much detail. Um, they're usually a tungsten anode um, with a hollow cathode, which will contain, um, which will be made of uh, the element of interest. So this hollow cylindrical cathode is made of the same element as the analyte. Then we will have this glass tube will be filled with neon or argon, which are generally inert gases, but we can produce ions um, to you know, complete the circuit and allow the formation of the light. And then we need a specific lamp for each specific element because these hollow cathode lamps really do produce a wavelength, which is very, very much specific to a particular element. And it's all to do really with those uh, energy levels. Um, if we have a certain energy associated with the distance between the ground state and the first excited state, that will have a wavelength because energy can be converted into wavelength via Planck's equation. And Planck's relationship also allows us to find out the wavelength. And so that specific wavelength will um, be very unique down to like um, fractions of a nanometer to a specific element. And so we'll only really be able to um, excite that particular element. So the hollow cathode lamp in AAS, so monochromators cannot isolate lines narrower than 10 to the minus two or 10 to the minus three nanometers. So that's why it's very necessary to get um, the correct frequency. So um, to get narrow lines of the correct frequency, we need to use a hollow cathode lamp, which contains the analyte element. And so that's going to be really, really specific for our uh, analyte. And so we're going to be able to measure it really well. So the high voltage required here is around about 300 volts and it's applied between the anode and the cathode. The filler gas here is ionized and positive ions are accelerated towards the cathode. The accelerated positive ions strike the cathode with high energy and sputter metal atoms from the cathode into the gas phase. And the free atoms are excited by collisions with high energy electrons. This is photo emission. So uh, we have a high voltage applied between the anode and the cathode. Uh, the filler gas here, which is the neon or argon, is then going to be ionized and um, positive ions are going to be produced. These positive ions will then be accelerated towards the negatively charged cathode and then 
the high energy with which that they strike against the cathode will be sufficient to sputter metal atoms off of this cathode. And then whenever these free atoms um, rejoin the cathode again, they will release light in terms of photo emission. And that light will be used to excite um, analyte elements in the flame of the uh, AAS. So atomic radiation has the same frequency that, absor that is absorbed by the analyte atoms. And this is because of the idea that there is a excited state and a ground state. And so the energy required to excite this um, in the analyte is the same as the energy released by the relaxation of the element inside of the hollow cathode lamp. So the cathode shape is cylindrical so that it can focus the emission um, beam into a beam. So you can see here, it's kind of like, I, I mean, it looks like a U shape here, kind of like a tuning fork from a musical instrument, um, but it's actually a cylinder. It's just sort of like a cut through the side. And so this cylinder then causes the light to be focused out through the quartz or pyrex window. Um, and so that beam can be used and can be directed towards the flame so that uh, atoms inside of the flame that are of the same analyte material um, as the element used in the cathode can be absorbed. So the line width of the hollow cathode lamp is sufficiently narrow. Uh, it's usually narrower than what's narrower than what's capable of being um, resolved by the monochromator. So we can see here, um, the blue line here is the width of the hollow cathode uh, lamp emission. And here is the width of the absorption line created um, by the absorption of the light in the flame, um, which is what the monochromator is going to um, discriminate. So atoms in the lamp are cooler than atoms in the flame. And so lamp emission is narrower than the absorption band within the flame. So if we recall back to the previous session, we might remember why that might be so. so Typically, Doppler broadening is going to be less of an effect whenever uh, we're at lower temperatures. So different lamps for each element. We also get less collisional um, broadening as well because the element has uh, less energy, so it's moving slower, so it doesn't have as many collisions. So there's a different lamp for each element, so I really have to stress this a lot. Um, in order to measure different elements using this technique, we need to have different lamps. So we can, there is no one size fits all the way that there was in UV vis spectroscopy. We only needed two to basically do every single molecule and we needed a In UV vis spectroscopy, we just needed a tungsten filament lamp and we a uh, lamp as well that would give us the full uv vis um, spectrum so the purpose of the monochromator in atomic spectroscopy so, so this is to select one line from the the hollow cathode lamp it's usually uh, used as a filter and to reject as much emission from the flame or furnace as possible so uh, the monochromator can cut out all of the extra lines so like um Whenever we were considering earlier, we have the grind state, we have the first excited state, but we also have higher excited states. Um, so depending on the energy that is supplied to the um, lamp, we can have a relaxation from, you know, like the, this, so this is the grind state, this is zero, this is one, and this is two. So the two is to zero and the, the one is to zero. Um, they have different wavelengths, so usually we just want one of the lines, so it's usually the major line, which would be the one is to zero line. So uh, here on the right hand side, we can see some examples of that. So this is the emission from a hollow cathode uh, tube. Um, we have three lines here, one, two, and three, which will be removed by the monochromator, the monochromator bandwidth, so the sort of the minimum number of wavelengths that it can um, cut out. So the basically the window it creates is this. So the bandwidth monochromator, so it cuts out one, two, and three, which would be the, the lower order transitions. Um, and so this light then is used um, as 
comes through the the bandwidth of the monochromator. It's broadened because of the uh, monochromator's inability to really isolate the very narrow lines that are produced by the hollow cathode ray um, tube. So the line becomes broader. Um, and then after the, the line passes through the sample, we have a lower um, power. So this is the emission spectrum after passage through the sample and the monochromator. So you can see that a lot of the radiant power has been reduced. So the atomic emission line is isolated with the monochromator. Source temperature and pressure are maintained below atomizer conditions to reduce Doppler broadening. And the radiant power is measured after passing through the sample the disadvantage of this method is that a different source lamp is needed for each element. So as I mentioned earlier, we have to have a lamp for iron, we have to have one for copper, we have to have one for sodium, we have to have one for uh, calcium. Uh, they, you cannot use the same lamp for different types of elements. Um, usually um, some AAS spectrometers that use a flame like this, they have a a quick change, kind of like it looks almost like a carousel where you can change the lamp pretty quickly. Um, you can have two or three or four or whatever, depends on the, the monochromator setup so that you can like measure the same sample by just changing the, the bulb uh, on the carousel. Um, the problem with this is that you're powering up some tubes for longer than maybe you really want to. Um, even at that, maybe you don't actually need all of the, the lamps during one measurement. So you have to take them out and replace them or whatever that's problematic. Um, there are a number of disadvantages to this method, but it is very accurate in the, in the sense that you're only going to be getting the signal from the analyte element that you want. So uh, the second part then of the AAS spectrometer is the atomizer. So this is where we, the AAS, of course, measures atomic concentration. And the atomization of particles is needed to obtain atoms for analysis. It's done by exposing the analyte to high temperatures in a flame or graphite furnace. We talked about this in the first session on atomic spectroscopy, where we considered the idea that the flame or the furnace heat up to very high temperatures, and then they basically burn the sample and destroy it, breaking it apart into its constituent atoms. And then these atoms are what we are actually going to measure whenever we pass the light through from the hollow cathode tube. And then after atomization, the analyte element is able to absorb the light from the lamp. So this is kind of a similar process to what we had in the UV vis spectrometer, where we had the UV light um, or the visible light absorbed by the sample, uh, hopefully just by the analyte, but it's not always true. Um, sometimes there's interference. Um, and then after that, what we're measuring is the light which is left after absorption has happened. And so by using that, that has a linear relationship in the linear section of the linear regression. Um, we are able to form a calibration curve. And then using that calibration curve, we'll be able to just kind of form a calibration curve, which allows us to get the concentration of our analyte. So a monochromator then is a multi-element detection. Uh, it helps in ICP AES. This is an Eschel uh, polychromator system. So it creates a two-dimensional image. So it combines both a prism and a grating. So it's kind of able to um, produce a uh, monochromated light on two dimensions. So we're able to, instead of just on a single dimension, which was the normal um, setup, we're now able to get um, two-dimensional uh, data. So we'll see why that's important soon. So we have the light source here, which passes through, of course, whatever um, sample we have. Then after that, we have um, this computer-adjusted source mirror. So this can be moved by the computer um, to fine-tune what light exactly we're getting or to try and make sure that uh, the correct light is being focused on the entrance slit. So it passes through the entrance slit, which of course creates a rectangular image. Then the collimating mirror is going to, to um, parallelize these lines. And then these parallelized lines um, will pass through the shell grating. They'll get um, split here, and then they'll get split again using the prism or lens, which will then create. So the this will split it on the horizontal direction, and then it will pass through the prism or lens, which will split it on the vertical direction. And then it will pass through the plane mirror, which will just reflect it onto this aperture plate, which is where we will take our measurements from. 
So you can see here we have um, the shell grating, which is the light is incident here somehow um, from the collimating mirror. Then it is diffracted along this axis, and then it passes through the prism, and it is going to be um, diffracted along the y-axis as well, which means that we get um, the diffraction order uh, for different wavelengths at the same time. So the two dispersion elements are arranged in series. This is higher dispersion and resolution than an echelette of the same size. So this is used in atomic emission spectroscopy so that we can get the um, data from a vast number of individual um, elements at the same time, because that's, that's the power of emission spectroscopy is that it doesn't require a hollow cathode tube and it just really uh, is good for samples which are a bit complex which have a large number of elements that need to be um, measured. And as well as that, those elements maybe don't have a, um, are quite time sensitive and need to be uh, measured immediately. So and a shell monochromator at the top here uh, has an arrangement of dispersing elements. So it's got the, the grating here, it's got the prism here. So before we talked about monochromators was either having gratings or prisms. So uh, prisms were typically the older types. So why not just use both is basically what's going on here in this shell uh, monochromator. So in the bottom uh, here, we have a schematic end on view of the dispersed radiation from the point of view of the transducer. So this is um, basically what's, what is called a CID. Uh, transducer so it can obtain the intensity of the light uh, by a function of the wavelength and the diffraction order here um, so this is the grading dispersion and this is the prism version which will give us the diffraction order and so we can get multiple different lines we can get multiple different um, points which can have different intensities and can tell us a little bit about the different um, components of our um, atomic emission spectrum so here's what it looks like in reality so um, we have here the, the plasma light coming in. Um, this passes through and then it is collimated here. And then it is reflected onto the, or in this case, it goes, the light comes in. It's a monochromatic light. Um, or sorry, white light. Then it gets split here by the prism, so they did the prism first, and then it goes on to the grating. I guess it doesn't really matter which direction you do it in. Uh, then it is it bounced off the foot, will be our transducer. So this is the polychromator for ICP emission with one detector for all all elements. And so the capabilities of a CID are that the pixels are individually addressed, meaning that each pixel um, has so no overflow. So for example, we um, overload a particular pixel with light, it doesn't affect the pixel beside it. Only the pixel that abs absorbing the light has a problem. One of the issues though with the CID is that there can be like um, a little bit of a lag between um, it getting the measurement and being able to be used again for a new uh, a packet of light so that it can be a little bit of distortion there, but generally it's enough and it's probably the um the best in class so here is a typical spectrum from atomic emission spectroscopy from an icp emission 
and the session but the um no So uh, this is a CID spectra for um, the ICP emission of iron. Um, PRISM spreads the wavelengths over 200 to 400 nanometers over most of the detector. So we can see here the wavelengths on the y-axis and the diffraction order n from Bragg's equation on the x-axis. Um, the grading provides a high resolution in the horizontal direction. So we get, um, we can see here the bunch, they sort of bunch up a little bit here at the top where we have, um, bright galaxies caused by the argon plasma leaking through. Well, argon is the, the plasma used in the ICP. So it's the one which is probably going to um, dominate our spectrum. There are ways in which we can try to remove that, which we will see later, but generally there's some of it leaks through anyway. And if we look here at the two peaks here and here, then we can see that these are the same wavelength, 238.204 and 238.204 nanometers. Now, they're separated only by their diffraction order. So this is n is equal to 140, and this is n is equal to 141. And you can see that there's really very good resolution on the horizontal direction. So remember, these can all be uh, obtained from uh, the equation um, that we have seen before based on diffraction, where um, it's, it's all re related with uh, Bragg's law. Uh, n lambda is equal to d, uh, the sum of the sine theta of the incident angle plus sine theta of the reflected angle. But why do we have these argon peaks in the spectrum? Um, it's due to the argon plasma emission. Not all of it is removed. There are some uh, remediation techniques that we can do use, and we will see those later. So here we have um, our background correction. So the background signals arise from absorption, emission, or scattering from the matrix, as well as flame, plasma, or furnace. So there are many different places that our background emission can come from. Um, our background emission can be a bit of an issue. Um, so these background signals need to be removed somehow. So um, we have here the wavelength, we have here the absorbance, we have the analyte signal that we want, but because we are measuring bronze in, um, in uh, nitric acid, which is what we dissolved it in, um, we have a bunch of iron and some lead, um, but what we're really interested in is, is copper. We also have this background signal, which has um, 0 0.3 absorbance. So you can see the, the baseline here is, should be really zero, but it's not. So we're going to need to correct for the background here. So how can we do that? I mean, we can't really have two flames. One, uh, like the way that we had an UV vis spectrometer, what we did was we had a blank and we had a our analyte sample. So we can't really do that here. Like you can't have a flame with the sample and a flame without the sample. But what you can do is, um, especially for absorption, is um, we can measure um, or use a rotating chopper, which will cut the lamp um, for a certain period of time, which will allow us to measure the flame of emission in between times. So what we have here is a source modulation method or beam chopping. This eliminates the flame emission. So what's happening is in the AAS, what we're doing is we're measuring the lamp and we're measuring um, how much of the lamp's power is absorbed as it passes through the burner. And then the other side is where we'll put our transducer or our like um, photo detector, CID. Um, but um, obviously, if we're measuring the whole time, we're getting both the absorption and the flame emission. So what we need to do is we need to block this light somehow. And we do that with our rotating chopper here. And then that will give us only the uh, light intensity, which comes from the flame emission at that particular um, wavelength. Um, so you can see here at the bottom, whenever the, the chopper is uh, blocking the beam of light from the lamp, we're only getting flame emission. And so that means that signal A minus signal B, signal A is the sum of the atomic absorption and the flame emission, minus signal B, which is only the flame emission, we will get only the analyte signal. 
So it kind of looks like this. You'll have detector signal, you'll have a lower signal whenever we have um, blocked beam because we're only getting emission. Then whenever we um, unblock the beam, we have a lamp and flame. And then we just have flame, lamp and flame, flame, lamp and flame, flame, lamp and flame. So the analytical signal then is going to be the difference between this level and this level. And so source modulation, so we look at the power supply of the source is designed for AC operation. So the source is switched on and off at the desired constant frequency. So here are some of the detection limits um, in nanograms per gram um, of our sample um, for different, uh, different um, forms of atomic spectroscopy. You can see that um, our detection limits are the smallest typically for um, ICPMS. Um, so that's inductively coupled plasma mass spectroscopy. Um, the furnace is usually a little bit better than the ICP emission. So ICP emission usually requires a reasonably high uh, concentration, Like, but it, it depends. It's not uniform. It's not that it's always like that. So for example, in the case of sodium ion, sodium metal, we need a higher concentration of inductively coupled plasma than we do for flame absorption. But uh, for others, it can be the other way around. Like rubidium, we need a lower concentration of ICP for for ICP emission than we do for flame atomic absorption. So it's not really necessarily always true that it's the same. So um, those that have gray borders at the top require um, a N2O nitrous oxide uh, acetylene flame and is therefore better analyzed by inductively coupled plasma because this is quite difficult to obtain and maintain. So it's also kind of a bit esoteric. Usually you just want acetylene and air or acetylene and oxygen. So if you have ICP, it's just generally better to have those. And then the blue ones are best analyzed by emission. So that's the case whereby we have um, lower concentration requirements for ICP compared to flame absorption. So detection limits for furnaces are two orders of magnitude lower than the flame. Uh, ICP detection limits are in, intermediate between flame and furnace generally. So uh, interference in AS, we've already talked a little bit about some of those, like we talked about the need to remove background and stuff like that. So interference is any effect that changes the signal while analyte concentration remains the same. So interference types include spectral interference, unwanted signals overlapping uh, of analyte signal, um, chemicals, the reactions are decreasing the concentration of analyte atoms, ionization, the reduction in neutral atom population. So spectral interference is the overlap of the analytical signal with unwanted signals from other elements and or flames. So this tends to be like isobaric type interference. Um, where a CD line, uh, so the cadmium line caused spectral interference with the arsenic line in many spectrometers because you can see that they're only separated by 0 0.01 nanometers. And so the two peaks are typically separated with a one meter long Cerny Turner monochromator with a resolution of 0 0.005 nanometers from 160 to 320 nanometers and 0 0.01 from 320 to 800 nanometers. So this long path uh, monochromator means that we can get resolution which will give us separation between these two peaks. Um, as well as that, um, some, like I talked before, there were some uh, yttrium oxides which really don't like to um, be separated and so are be combusted into their elements, which kind of means that we end up with uh, broad spectra. So uh, spectral interference here, so problem solving. So we have overlapping lines from different elements in the same sample. So where what we're doing here is we're, we're trying to um, measure this laser radiated yttrium uh, barium copper oxide. So the elements that form very stable diatomic oxides are incompletely atomized at the temperature of the flame and furnace. So yttrium oxide is not completely atomized because it's um, very stable. Um, and then much broader and more complex spectrum than that of an atom. So you can see here the barium lines are quite sharp, whereas the yttrium oxide lines are really, really jagged and they're overlapping with each other. And that's because it's not actually um, in its uh, elemental atomic form. So what we need to do is we need to get a higher temperature, typically using ICP. Or we can um, uh, make use of other methods. So chemical reactions decrease atomic 
our atomization efficiencies, the amount of analyte that is atomized. So for example, um, sulfate and phosphate hinder the atomization of calcium by forming non-volatile salts. So that means that we need to get a releasing agent. So we use like things like EDTA, which forms a stable but volatile, volatile species with a uh, copper two plus, or we can um, use lanthanum three plus, which preferentially interacts with the sulfate and the phosphate, thus freeing the copper. Um, so there's like, a few different options. So what we can do is we can try to form more volatile species, um, which will be completely atomized, or we can try to um, use a sacrificial ion. So ionization interference. So this is the ionization of analyte atoms decreases the concentration of neutral atoms. And so the energy levels of ionized atoms are different from neutral atoms. And so we here have gas phase ionization reactions where M in the gas phase goes to M plus in the gas phase plus E, the electrons in the gas phase. And the problem in the analysis of alkali metals, even at relatively low frame temperatures, because alkali metals have low ionization potential. So it's pretty easy to ionize them to remove an electron with even just the low temperature flames. So the solution here is to add an ionization suppressant to decrease the ionization of the analyte. So for analysis strontium, analysis of strontium, we add potassium because potassium has a lower ionization potential. So that means what happens is that the potassium is ionized first, and this produces free electrons. These free electrons then increase the number of electrons that are available in the flame so that if any strontium is actually ionized, it will immediately be um, Ox are immediately be reduced back to um, strontium. And so you can see here, the ionization potential for potassium is much lower than that for strontium. And so if we provide a high concentration of electrons to the flame from the potassium plus um, electron, we suppress the ionization of the analyte strontium. And so we increase the chances that it will be reduced if it does in fact oxidize. So um, one of the ways that we can also overcome many of the limitations of atomic spectroscopy is through the standard addition method. Remember I said before that the main use for atomic spectroscopy is to actually measure environmental samples. So we've seen before how environmental samples can cause what's called a matrix effect. And this matrix effect was causing problems whenever we tried to measure the samples, you know, for example, our calibration curves, which show a reduced um, analyte response compared to like just a solution made in distilled water, things like that. So the standard addition method is, is very good where we sort of spike our environmental sample with um, some of our analyte element and that enables us to form a calibration curve. And so we're able to actually accurately measure the concentration of our original sample. So you can see here a standard curve of strontium in water has a different response compared to that in aquarium water. So the slope is shallower in the aquarium water because of the matrix effect, and it is steeper, so it is more selective in water. And that's because there's less things to interact with the strontium and to uh, reduce its um, absorbance. So the benefits of ICP, so ICP is twice as hot as a conventional flame. So this means it can like um, oxidize some of those particularly stable um, oxides, like the yttrium oxide that we saw earlier in the yttrium barium copper oxide. Um, the residence time of the analyte in the plasma is twice as long as well, so it stays there for longer, so it gets um, more complete atomization. The signal then is enhanced, and we get negligible formation of oxides and hydroxides. So that's the yttrium oxide being actually um, broken up into yttrium and oxygen. And so ICP is also free from background radiation, and the temperature in ICP is more stable because of the limited self-absorption. So uh, here is a comparison of some of the atomic analysis methods. So we have detection limits of flame absorption are, are quite high um, and gets lower and lower until we get to the plasma emission, which is pretty low, um, not as low as furnace. Furnace is better. Furnace absorption is more sensitive than plasma emission. But if we couple plasma with mass spectroscopy, we get this really, um, really, really sensitive measurement. Uh, so it also has a higher linear range, which means it can cover a broader range of concentrations. Um, it's also more precise. Um, there are not as many interferences uh, and so on. We do need a reasonable amount of sample though, but less than the uh, flame absorption. The problem is that if we take the value of, uh, or the cost for a flame absorption spectrometer, it costs about 10 to 15 times more for a plasma mass spectroscopy um, than it does for a flame absorption measurement. 
So uh, this ICP MS, so what does it look like? So this is the interface between an ICP and the mass spectrometer. So we have our ICP here, which has got its torch and the plasma. And so we could set up a, a detector here for emission if we wished. Um, but usually what happens is that the, the plasma, which is um, burning the sample is passed through the sampling cone uh, where there is a vacuum here to avoid collision between the ions and gas molecules. And this diverts the ions from the trajectory in the field. So basically we have um, decreases in pressure as we go through here to sort of suck it through. And so the negative uh, here attracts the positive ions. So this helps to remove some of the like um, positive argon species, the reactive argon species that are in the plasma and any which do not. So this is the vacuum pumps reduce the pressure, which is why it's sucked in. Um, then we have here the, um, what's called the quadrupole uh, dynamic uh, reaction cells, quadrupole because there's four, uh, four of these reaction cells, quadrupole. Um, this is this contains like um, a reactive gas like ammonia, and its main purpose here is to react with uh, argon plus or argon oxygen plus species uh, from the plasma because these are isobaric and may interfere with the analyte signals due to having similar masses. Um, so this isobaric interference is caused by ions of similar mass. So for example, this um, argon forty uh, oxygen sixteen plus has the same uh, mass as uh, iron fifty six plus. Um, and then this um, argon species here has the same mass as um, selenium plus, so it can cause um, weird effects in our mass spectrometer, um, where we have these two peaks um, being detected at the same point. And so this is the use of this collision cell. Then um, after that, the ion path is diverted um, through a mass selector, mass separator, before it is counted at the detector. So the ICPMS is one of the most important techniques for analytical and elemental analysis. It is a big mass range from 300 to up to from three to up to 300. Although recently there have been developments that have suggested that we can go up to 4,000. Um, the ability to resolve ions differing by um, masses of difference only one. 90% um, of the elements in the periodic table can be determined. It has detection limits of uh, 0 0.1 to 10 ppb. Um, the RSD, the, the, the deviation or the error here is two to 4%. The dynamic range is six orders of magnitude and it's got fast analysis around about 10 seconds for each element type. So it can be used to measure and determine the concentration of things like mercury or lead in um, different samples. So Hawaiian coffee typically has low levels of mercury in it, but it does have quite high levels of lead. Whereas in... Um, Cuban coffee, we have high, high amounts of mercury compared to Hawaiian coffee, uh, uh, whereas the, the lead is somewhat less, um, although it contains both mercury and lead, whereas the, the Hawaiian barely contains any. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not actually like a huge, huge amount of mercury and lead, but it is some, and it's detectable by this ICPMS. Because remember that we've got detection limits of rounded by PPB. Um, so laser ablation ICPMS. So this was used in a, an anthropological study to look at uh, teeth from people um, now and teeth from people before. So uh, here we can see that there are not so many heavy metals in the modern tooth from um, someone in Poland. And then uh, if we look back 200 years ago, we can see that there are a great many um, heavy metals in the teeth of some people who lived at that time. And the reason for this is the cookware they used. So the cookware they used um, wasn't, uh, the metals weren't as pure as they are now. Um, now, whenever we use cookware, um, it's very pure. It's, it's pure aluminum, it's pure steel, pure iron, whatever it happens to be. Um, whereas before they weren't able to purify it quite as well. And so there were many trace heavy metals. Um, some of them they didn't even know existed at this stage 200 years ago. Um, and those went into their food and then they would eat those. And then some of them would end up in their teeth um, because your teeth are not like, they can't absorb some metals. What happens is some of the calcium maybe gets replaced in the calcium phosphate. Um, so uh, what they did was the uh, laser ablation ICPMS. So this is where the uh, high powered laser, maybe a, in this case, the microscopic creator ablated into a muscle shell by 10 pulses from a 266 nanometer laser with a beam energy of 4.5 millijoules per 10 nanosecond pulse and a repetition rate of 10 hertz, so it's 10 waves per second. So this is a way of um, atomizing the sample for the ICPMS. 
So uh, with that, let's do our comprehension check. So we're asked, what considerations do we need to take when choosing a light source for AAS? Please take a moment to uh, try and think about this for yourself, and then we will go over it in a minute. Okay, pause if you need more time. Let's answer the question. So for AAS, when using a hollow cathode lamp, we need to use a lamp of the same element as the analyte element uh, of interest because they produce light of very specific wavelengths. And so that wavelength is specific to the element. Um, so that means it's easier to measure our analyte. Okay, thank you for watching.